All right, we are live here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the fourth episode of the Healing Through Mind and Motion podcast, uh, where we explore the mind and body and how we can help overcome chronic pain and illness so that we live a life that we love. I'm Brian Cade, your host, and today we have an amazing guest, uh, Caitlin Walker. She is the developer of Systemic Modeling, the author of From Contempt to Curiosity, and also she is interested in uh, symbolic modeling for chronic pain and physical symptoms. Um, I've been on a couple of your trainings, I've read the book, and uh, just such a fascinating field, like, and just it's the experience of it. it. I've done a lot of different change work and nothing comes close to symbolic modeling or systemic modeling as of yet that I'm aware of. And so excited to have you here. Welcome to this show. It's great to be here. It's um, already, it's starting, you know, we had a little pre-chat before we went live and it's already starting to fire off my neurons and remembering how I got into this and what my early influences were. So yeah, it's, it's, I'm already excited. Awesome. So for those that don't know, because I try, I've tried sometimes to share like what symbolic modeling is. I'm like, it's really powerful. It deals with metaphors. And as soon as I say metaphors, it's like, oh yeah, I know what that is. And then kind of zone out. So how do you share what you do and what it is? Um, hmm. So if you think of clean questions developed by David Grove, um, he's uh, got a, a Maori and a British uh, back, uh, background, inheritance, and um, he developed a process for working with clients with long-term symptoms, childhood trauma, um, Vietnam vets, people with like that. And when I first saw him work, probably one of the easiest ways for me to explain it is to explain how I got into it. But um, I saw him work and I was like, oh, okay. He's asking clean questions that help to develop metaphors. They're not just metaphors in the mind, they're metaphors in the space, metaphors in the body. So they're embodied experiences, out-of-bodied experiences, proprioception. They're, they're ways of putting structure to our unconscious experience or somatic experience. And then as he asks questions of that structure, it informs our whole system. We're like, oh, that's, that's what that is. That's what this is. So if I give you a little tiny bit of the, the very first time I saw him, I was, you know, in terms of my background, then I was studying anthropology and linguistics. I was about 26 ages uh, years old I went to see him and he did he was doing some work with a a woman on on um stage we were watching therapy and it was extraordinary she was talking about losing her voice so her physical symptom was that when she tried to do public speaking as part of her job nothing came out and she'd had this as long as she could remember when she had something important to say it was like <gasps> she went into freeze and he was saying so when it goes you know what would you like to have happen she said I, I want to find my voice and she said what kind of find she said well it's like it's just it's disappeared and it's disappeared and you'd like to find your voice and when it's disappeared where has it disappeared she said, into a hole and what kind of hole is that hole and slowly where what kind of these really simple, clean questions would develop this landscape? And she got this, this it helped her to recreate a horrific memory um, for those of us watching that she had walked into a room, opened a door, and she, her father shot himself in the head. And as she'd opened the door, she had never, she'd frozen in time. She'd never screamed, she'd never shouted out. She hadn't managed to stop it. And that what was happening is that her body was replaying this trauma every time she had something important to say. And I watched that and I thought, that is extraordinary. He never judged it, he never interpreted it. He simply used the clues in her symptoms now to help the body make sense of itself. And you could see her, I was watching her, and I don't know a lot about, um, about physiology. This is not my, special, my specialism 
in that way. It's something I'm very interested in, but I am always the clean language side of it, not the physiotherapy side of it. But I could see her breathe differently, you know, because I'm quite empathic. I hold things in my body. I was like, oh, yeah, she's been breathing up here. And now there was this deep, deep breath. And so I watched him work. I thought, that is extraordinary. And I can absolutely see logically how somatic memories can get locked in the body. So that was my very first introduction to this work. So when you say, what is symbolic modeling? It is modeling the symbols of symptoms such that the system can remake sense of itself back to itself and then potentially can reintegrate. Wow. Yeah, a great story to start off with. It's uh, the, the you mentioned the embodied aspect of it. It's like, yes, you're talking about metaphors, but it's the experience in your I know I've had sessions where I'm feeling all of the things around me or like the, where the hole is. Um, I know we did a little bit and there was like an arrow and there was a conquistador behind me. Um, and it just becomes very real. And um, just like you said, it's amazing what gets locked in the body and how through the questions it brings us to that uh, experience. And we have those insights. Um, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think it's the for me, it was the lack of interference. I mean, straight after, like, when I watched David Grove work, I would have just gone, wow, what an amazing therapist. By then, that's not what I do. Yeah. But because I, I was paying for my way through college um, by being a youth worker, and we had to do a little exercise afterwards, which was just four questions. It was, you've got to go and get with a partner in the room, Hmm. and you had to ask them what would you like to have happen and then whatever they say you choose a word and you say um what kind of where and then is there anything else so I got together with this guy and I have to show you more of my body um and he said what would you like to have happen and I was like oh I'd like to find my path and he said what kind of path is that path and I went one that is compelling. Mm -hmm. And he said, where is that path? And I went, oh, hmm. oh, look, it's over there. Yeah. And he went, and is there anything else about that path? And I looked down at my feet and I looked at my hand and I went, I'm not on it. And then that was the end of the session. So that's four questions, four ridiculously little questions with some bloke that I'd never met before. And I sat there and went, my feet are going this way. I was doing, I'd, I'd just signed up. I was, I'd started my PhD, in, well, PhD in artificial intelligence, in linguistics and, and how computers understand human speech. I was miserable as sin. Huh. And I was like, mm. and then that night I looked at what my body knew that my brain clearly didn't know. Yeah. which was, I was on the wrong path. And I left my PhD, I left my partner of 14 years. I simply walked out of that life. Hmm. And I said, I know fundamentally that these questions have got, I can take them out of the world and do things with them. And I just went and follow, followed him. And so wow. th that's a bit like you're saying there, it was like, this wasn't made up. This mm -hmm. wasn't, like I didn't know that this was where my path is, but the questions allow little clues. And then so long as you're observing what's going on in the system, you're like, whoa, my yeah. body knows I'm in the wrong way and I'm gonna go this way and not this way. And I think I was making myself ill sitting in front of a computer day in and day out then. Um, wow. So yeah, so. It, it seems like there's so much more information that like the body knows or the mm -hmm. system, body system that we're not even aware of. And like you said, those se seemingly simple questions, you had four questions and it completely changed the direction of your life. Yeah. Um, that's incredible. Was it just that awareness that made you choose it? Or because sometimes it's like, okay, I know I'm going the wrong direction, but I don't want to step off that path. So was it the awareness or just, I know you seem to be a pretty courageous or fearless person. Okay. Um, from but what I, I know. But I hadn't been up until then. You know, I was doing things I'd been miserable for a while. I did my PhD because my supervisor told me I should. Um, I'd said to them, 
I don't think I'm ready for a PhD. I don't even know what I'm interested in. He's like, no, no, you'll just be my research assistant. I was very acquiescent hmm. to other people's needs. Wow. Um, most of my life. And this was, it was like, it was like my system was going, no, what we need is we need to go here. Hmm. And so I simply acquiesced to this. <laughs> to... So I didn't feel, it wasn't courageous. It was like I had no choice. Wow. It was a very strange feeling. Um, yeah. And it seems like the way you described it, it was truly like a pivot point, like mm. everything shifted and you went down that path. Yeah, I had to find a new place to live. Um, yeah, I don't know. I turned over Penny Tompkins and James Lawley's door. door. They were um, friends and colleagues of mine. Uh, we'd studied NLP together um, and I'd been their assistant in NLP and that's neuro linguistic programming. And they it was them that had invited me to come and watch David Grove work. And so I turned up at their door and I said, OK, I'll do whatever it takes. Just let me find out how to do what this man is doing, because I think I can use it with the teenagers I work with. I think I can use it in. Not as a therapist, but as a. Just I'm just I just want to know how it works. Right, right. So and how did you start using it with teenagers? Because I, I know it's in the book, but it's like for those that don't know, it's like what type of things were you learning, seeing um, yeah. when you brought it there? So actually, it was something interesting is this was just one of the little insights I had just before we uh, we went live. Um, when I was quite young, my mom is um, she's American and she was interested in Feldenkrais. Feldenkrais um, taught this whole movement about awareness through movement. Hmm. And so I knew a little bit about that. I knew a little bit about, um, do you know, how, how we lock ourselves into different patterns in our body when actually we have a bigger range of movement than we allow ourselves to. And if you increase your range of movement, you also increase your ability to think in different ways as well. So I knew a little bit about that. And um, when because I'd left my PhD and I had to find a new house and I had to find a job. Um, I thought, okay, well, I'll go and get some teenagers to work with. I'll go and see if I can find a new job. And I got a job with kids who were outside of the school system, very violent, some elected mutes, um, really quite damaged or damaging children. And I thought, what am I going to offer them? Because I want to be the work of, of clean language, which is works with an individual system, I want to work with them as a whole system of individuals. How do I take the principles? Let's, let me go back a little bit. The principles of the clean questions are, I trust that your system has the answer. I do not need to lead you. I trust that whether it's a gesture or a word, like I want to find my path, that I can accept and extend whatever you've given me, either the word or the gesture, and your system will build meaningful models around it. Mm. And that when we understand the models, the models inform back into the system and then the system has more flexibility and choice. So instead of being locked into something, it can, it can make choice. So these are these sort of principles that I had. Um, and then you have these teenagers. Well, Whenever people work with teenagers, and actually I bet you this translates into when people work with physical symptoms as well, they're always wanting to correct them. Mm -hmm. They're always wanting them to go away or stop feeling like that or feel some other way. And that's a very unclean way of dealing with them. So I wanted to go to the teenagers the way David Grove's questions had landed on me, which was just to go, what are you like? What's happening? And then to take clues and start to build meaning out of it. So we went to these, I had 10, 10 um, teenage boys, big, or some big, some smaller, um, mm -hmm. all about 14 years old. And I'd interviewed them separately in their own homes. So, you know, what, what do you want to get out of it? What's happening at the moment? They said, oh, wait, I want to be able to control my temper. was a, a regular thing that came over. People are always winding me up. I hurt them and then I get into trouble. So I said, like, okay, we'll start with temper. So when you're losing your temper, it's like what? One of the kids goes, oh, I go red. And I go, so what I'm doing is, although now I'm 
what I'm doing is I'm watching the group because whereas if it was just me and him, I'd be modeling just him. Now I'm trying to get the group to notice each other. So I'm going, when you go red, whereabouts is that red? Now I know it's here. I just watched it. Right. And I'm helping him know and I'm helping them notice that they already saw these. So I'm teaching them to pay attention. So he goes, oh, it's just here. So you know, anything else when it's blood red? He says, yeah, it's it wants to shoot out of me. So okay, so it's blood red and it wants to shoot out of you. Who's different to that? Someone else says, oh, I just... I just snap. Okay, just where, whereabouts is that snap? It's in my head. He said, someone looks at me, they're on mm -hmm. the floor. And so what we were doing, we were modeling the pre-response to their violence, which is systemic. It's in the bodies, it's in their minds. And so we we modeled, the kid who goes red, um, before, it, before it's red, it's a bit like what? He says, oh, it's maroon. And... He moves his hand down a bit and he says, before it's maroon, it's like, what? He says, oh, it's, uh, then it's purple. And before it's purple, he goes, Phew. it's like the sky, it's blue, like my mum. And those are big physiological shifts. So if you yeah. think that that boy says he spends nearly all of his time like this, you can think that is, that's a toll on, on his body. Yeah. So we modeled, we modeled the guy goes red, the guy who, Snap, snaps there's one of the kids says i never get into trouble i never get into fights i don't lose my temper so what happens when there's trouble around you and there's this little noise and it's his feet mm. and he, so i've seen his feet but the kids haven't seen his feet like and they're like yeah but you know what about when someone's winding you up in the class he said what happens he said i'm just out of there and it's, you can hear this little and so again we i say also oh, i wonder which part of him knows when it's time to get out of there. And they're like, it's his feet, miss. I said, yeah. yeah. So what we're doing is we're raising awareness across the system about physical symptoms. And what was so interesting about this was in the same way that when the, um, the, the client of David's wasn't able to breathe and kept losing her voice. And then as they developed the metaphor landscape, she had this deep breath. As the kids were listening to one another, they're also expanding their own awareness of themselves. The next session that they came in, they'd only been there, we'd only done one little session together. The kid who goes red, he comes in, he goes, you know what, miss? I get up in the morning, my dad's drunk, red. There's no food to eat, red. He said, there's, there's no money to take my clothes to the laundry, so I've got to put sweaty clothes on, and they smell, red. He said, there's no money for me to get the bus, I've got to run to school, and as I run to the school, I get hot and I stink, red. He said, Miss, when I get to school, my red's right here. Is that is that why I hit people? And I say, because it's again, it's a very clean response to say, I don't know, what you know, what do people think? And he says, Well, I'm thinking that if I'm very red, when I get to school, just before I get to school, I'm gonna stop at Clapton Duck Pond, which is like a little old pond, like a city pond. He said, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna look at the sky and I'm gonna breathe in blue and make myself purple. I'm gonna think about my mum breathe in blue and make myself purple. And then I think I can keep my temper in school. Do you think that'll work? I said, well, you'll need to try it. Go try it for a week, tell us next week. But what they were starting to do was that by creating models of their symptoms, they were able to update their models by learning from one another. So. Yeah, um, that's one of the things I love about the systemic modeling that you created is it's like, the symbolic modeling you're learning from yourself and it's like systemic you get to hear different perspectives like i never thought about motivation feeling that way or when we model motivation and so for them it's like you said they get to update it's yeah just love how powerful it is and never know where it's going to take you no uh, and you know and i never it was like i knew that the bodies were involved but because i'm not a body specialist it it took a little while you know, I had a client, when I was first learning David's work, before I took it out into groups, I had a client who said, oh, can you do this stuff with back pain? I said, I've got no idea, just come along, don't pay. My, my rule was always, don't pay me at all until I've had three clients who've had success in that area. Hmm. Because I don't, I can't tell you that I think it'll work. So she came along and I was with a woman called Dee Berridge. We used to co-model 
partly for safety so we could keep an eye on each other and partly for learning. So when she was modeling, I could reflect and learn on what she was doing. And when I was practicing, she could reflect and, and um, learn from me. And so this person said, you know, I've, I've got back pain. And I said, so, you know, whereabouts is it? She said, oh, it's in my back. I said, whereabouts in your back? She said, just, you know, just at the base of my spine. I said, it's just at the base of your spine. Does it have a size or a shape? And she said, well, it's kind of, um, it's kind of a, and I said, so when it's kind of a, kind of a, so I thought this is a little bit like mine. It's like, she hasn't got words for it, but you could see, you know, I don't know if you can see, but you could see the, the sinews. Hmm. And when it's kind of a, is there anything else about this? And she said, it's like a claw. She said, it's a metal claw. And there's a, there was a slight change in the way she was talking. She said, it's a metal claw and it's locked in the base of my spine. She said, oh, it's a, and then we just modeled it. It's a metal claw and it's locked and kind of metal. She said, it's a precious metal. Is there anything else about that precious metal? She said, it's been really, really well looked after. It's burnished. Yeah, it's burnished. It's really, really well looked after. Is there anything else about that claw that's really, really well looked after metal? She said, it used to be a hand. Hmm. So when it used to be a hand, is there anything else about that hand? She said, it used to be a loving hand. And as she worked through the symptom, she got in touch with that she'd been very poorly as a small child hmm. and that her mum had taken very, very good care of her. But it had also become where she didn't go out and she and her mum became very, very locked into each other. Mm. And that her being ill was one of the ways that she kept herself locked into her relationship with her mum. And so now I don't, again, I don't, there was no miraculous at this stage. She just was like, what a realization. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know very much about the body. So I didn't, I didn't go any further than that. Yeah. Then I would coach her on a relationship, but I wouldn't necessarily coach the body hmm. because I'm not a body specialist. So. Yeah. Yeah. So my current understanding, it's like, because I, I, I started with the body. I was a personal trainer and then started doing posture alignment work and working with helping people move without pain. And so it's like, I can see the structural mechanics that where things don't move right and there's pain. I also know on the other side that every emotion we have has a physical reaction. Like someone mm -hmm. who's holding, has anger, there's going to be that, like the red in the chest. Um, sometimes it's in the hands squeezing or shoulders tensing. And so it's like, those are all muscle patterns that are being learned. I'm curious. So there's that aspect of like the hand gripping. There's also, from what I know that if you're chronically or you're, anxious often or depressed or practicing anger or guilt, shame, all of that, that that alone will affect your body's capacity to heal. Mm -hmm. With modeling physical symptoms, is it, well, whatever's relevant, because where I'm sometimes get stuck is like, is this a physical, structural, mechanical thing? Or by modeling the physical symptom, will whether it's holding on to grief or whether it's even just like tension in the jaw, like a TMJ from being stressed, does that all show up in a modeling session? Like whatever is relevant shows up. And if it's not relevant, it doesn't, or how does that yeah, work? It's well, I think it's one of those things where and it must be the same, I guess, from, from a body works perspective, you don't know whether there's a body, something that the mind doesn't understand that therefore it sends more sensors down and you make up stuff about it. And then whatever you make up aggravates it. And, you know, it's that cycle yeah. or some things which are very emotional that you were dissociated, you went into freeze, you are running um, reflexes that aren't required anymore. You know, and that is ex exacerbating the body. But either way, once it becomes chronic, the way you feel about it and the stories that you tell yourself about your body, as yeah. you said, exacerbate the way it can heal or not heal. Mm. Um, and I, do, I want to be very clear here, it's something we, we talked a little bit about before. I think that um, it's very, very, it was very, very important in clean work 
is that the client is not shamed by the therapist yeah. for their symptoms. And the therapist has no real outcome for the client. So, so with the same with these teenagers, like it was not my job to make those boys control their temper. That mm. emerged from them having greater understanding of their system. And I think that's really important in the clean body work is I don't know if your condition is organic, is structural, is emotional. So it's really important that we don't get into the, I, I find it difficult sometimes to be around people who absolutely believe that you can, you know, you can heal yourself. Because if you can't, that's a really, really shaming where, you know, you could, but you just haven't tried hard enough or you haven't got enough faith. Yeah. And that's a really cruel thing to do, especially um, because the people I know who do it tend to be very well in themselves. Um, and, you know, to, yeah. Uh, so tw 26, when I started getting 25, 26, when I started getting migraines, like four to five times a week. And like when I worked with coaches, sometimes they're like, well, it's an emotion that you haven't dealt with. You need to deal with that. I'm like, I have no idea what emotion I'm not dealing with. If you can point that out and tell me, like, I'm happy to work through it. But right now I just know I'm in pain and I got nothing. And then like I'd work with body people that helped. The process helped and there are things that we still use. And it's like, well, you're just overthinking the muscles. Like you're just overthinking it. And I'm like, Okay, well, tell me what part I'm overthinking because I'll change what I'm doing. And it's uh, it's incredibly frustrating because I looked healthy. Yeah. But on the inside, I'm like, I'm falling apart and can't walk a half a block. And so, yeah, yeah that we don't know where it's, that's kind of where I try to approach is like, I have no idea where this is coming from. It could be emotional. It could be physical. Let's meet where somebody's at. And I do my best and I, I can always work to grow is like, Let's see what shows up and not judge it and just keep expanding and exploring right. so that we get as well as we can. Yeah. And I think that's where um, the, the clean models that we developed in systemic modeling, that's where they come from, is if you think about, just take that phrase, um, this is an emotion you haven't dealt with. Mm -hmm. So it's, I will get my little flip chart. So it's like... Um, if I use a drama, hmm. if I use a drama model, it's like they're saying you're not okay, so it's like they're persecuting you. Yeah. Um, you know, if you think about so, the, if these are some of the the emotional states you can get locked in. This is just um, this is Cartman's drama triangle, but I use this with kids as a way of noticing if they're taking a position in a repeated pattern. So rescuer. And when people give you advice like that, they're often trying to rescue you. Mm -hmm. They're believing that your system can't solve itself. So I will tell you advice. When advice, when you're rescuing, advice is often comes from a form of you're not okay. Yeah. So that's an emotion you haven't dealt with. If you deal with that emotion, it'll be right. A, that's fundamentally not true. Because it's, it's so narrow, the chance that what they're making up in the head is true for you is just unlikely. It might have worked for them. Maybe they read about it that it worked for somebody else. But it is not necessarily true. Or you're overthinking your muscles. There's nothing you could be there but to, but to end up in a victim state of like, I must be, a, I must be an idiot. I must be. Yeah. Or you can put it back to them and go, well, if you're going to give me that advice, you tell me what to do. If you're so smart, tell me, what should I think yeah. instead? Or, yeah, so it was yeah. very, very important and clean that we didn't do that. And it's a difficult little thing to, because lots of those, lots of us who are involved in change work, coaches and, you know, body workers, we're problem solvers. And when things get stuck, we can often move into drama when we cease to be problem solvers, we start to be blamers. Hmm. And um, it was the same with the teenagers. They'd say, oh, they just need to do this. I'm like, do you know, you have no idea what it is like to wake up in a foreign country 
with a father who is drinking because his political activism has all stopped and he's he's a refugee here now and you don't have enough to eat and your clothes smell you have no idea what it's like to to wake up like that and even if you've had a horrible life it was a different horrible life to his horrible life yeah. and the symbolism the chances that the thing that would allow you to control your temper is to look at an old duck pond and breathe in blue from the sky and bring your mother back into your heart mm -hmm. do you know it's idiosyncratic so i think when we looked at chronic pain um like the claw what we're really interested in in the clean body work is what is idiosyncratically unique to this body that so you know with your migraines what we'd be interested in is holding in hypotheses really really lightly i don't know why you've got migraines mm -hmm. i don't know if they're serving you or it's just chemical or yeah but we'll go and investigate with a very um we look for evidence but with a very low agenda yeah it's interesting i haven't gotten to do the session with you yet um but i worked with marion and we had a session and it wasn't about chronic pain but when i get migraines i tend to fall to the right and everything feels like it collapses and disappears and when we did the modeling all my goals were off to my right instead of straight ahead in front of me and there was like this wall almost like leaning me over to the right and it was just interesting because that sensation is what i normally feel and that wall when as further was basically my dad nudging me in the right direction of what i wanted and he did it but it was a little bit too forceful um and i know now that he just wanted what was best but it was all nudged like forced that direct the direction that fits and when that changed and it was like the goals were in front of me. It was like, oh, I can stand up better. Mm -hmm. And just it was just amazing um, to experience how never in a million years would have guessed. Because at some point, I'm like, what? why is everything over here? And I didn't even know the wall was there until we explored it. Um, yeah. So that was this really powerful experience of how like the sensations get connected. Um, and I, th I think one of the things that you've picked up there, which I think is so interesting with this work, is how things get layered upon so structure gets layered on structure gets layered on structure yeah so i i disappear um i can I, I get very very distracted but i disappear out of there um i go out of the doors and it affects my posture so when i disappear my body lifts up and slightly to my left hmm. and so it i get a sway back when i do it but it's kind of where i go where i go to think hmm. when we you know you can just model that's the way i go to think and that was interesting enough and then the, if you're going to be a, if you were my physiotherapist you're never going to get me to stop thinking like right. I, I go over there but then we could look at what what exercises i could do to my body to manage it mm -hmm. but what i then did when i was doing some uh, therapy on a therapy retreat with David, um, David Grove. I'm like, I know what that is. Years and years ago, and I must have been about five, five or six. My parents were arguing in the kitchen, and my dad, my mum said to my dad, I could hear her shouting at him that he needed to go and he, he could never come back. And I tried to do a thing which children can do sometimes. So I. I'll distract the situation. So I ran up to him. Do you know how children stand on your feet and then you walk? So I put my hands up to him to hold my hands and went to stand on his feet. And he hit me. Now, my, it was the only time he's ever hit me in my life. I didn't, wasn't raised, beaten or anything like that. But it was such a shock. And it was a shock on lots of levels. One is I was off my balance because I put my hands up. So I fell. Secondly, I wasn't expecting it. Um, it came out of the blue. And thirdly, I was already in an anxious state because I was trying to stop him leaving. So like as a little person, I was yeah. trying to stop a big thing happening, which and obviously I didn't because he, he did leave and he didn't come back. Um, but the, that fissure in my psyche space, if we could call it that, there are other things that then get layered onto that structure. Do you know, yeah. so like with you, you your migraines, it feels like you're falling that way and you keep your goals down there. And, you know, it's 
Mm -hmm. um, it becomes the way we organize our psyche space for, and things can get cluttered or things can get, there can be messy corners. Right. And that's, it's, that's, what's interesting is like, you don't know which part. And one of the reasons we're trying to combine both is it's like, you don't know which way is going, which end to focus on. And if you shape the whole experience, you get to see what layers tie in and how they affect. Yeah. Um, I know you said with the claw, you didn't get to the point where you resolved anything. I know later, I believe later, you started to do more with- Yeah, well that was, yeah, somebody came and spotted it. So, yeah. so we did, after the back pain, we did do working with disease, like dis-ease. So we did start modeling some physical symptoms, but I was always, um, I think compared to some others in the field, I tend to be uh, very humble about claiming results. Mm -hmm. Because what I would always say is the, my, my biggest nightmare would be if I taught the, the world to ride unicorns and then it turns out there weren't any unicorns and then I've wasted my life. So it's like, I wanted to make sure I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And we were working up in Newcastle at one point and we've done a therapeutic retreat and this woman, her name was Catherine Saeed and she was, she was head of muscle, muscular skeletal physiotherapy at Newcastle General Hospital. So she was a really experienced yeah. woman. And she'd come to learn the process. And she said, do you know that when people, when people's metaphors transform and update and resolve, do you know that their bodies are changing at the same time? And I said, I know it instinctively, but because I don't know how the body works, I don't really know it. Yeah. And she said, I'm, I'd be really interested to further some of this research. But she then went back to work and one of her other physios that she worked with had had a, um, an ankle injury and uh, an Achilles heel, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd been working on it for weeks and it just wasn't getting better. And she said to her, oh, this woman's been teaching us this clean language stuff. Can, we, can I give that a go? And she said, so thinking about your ankle, it's a little bit like what? And she said, it's, um, she said, it's like, it's, it's like this. And she said, anything else about it when it's like this? She said, it's, uh, uh, it's like, it's like a spring, but it's gone wiggly. And she said, what kind of wiggly? And she drew it. And she said, the two of them sat there and looked at it and went, oh, we've misdiagnosed this. We've been treating it like it's too tight, but it's not, it's got a, a little tear, a little nick. Oh, and then they changed their treatment pattern on a basis of this drawing that she'd made. And then she came and she said, right, I'm sold now. And so what she did was she brought us, um, she brought me six people who had intractable symptoms. That is what they were trying to do didn't, didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were willing to try anything um, because I had said I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't take payment until we knew it was going to be useful mm -hmm. or we'd, you know, people had to know it was an experiment and they were just really interesting, but they started to be like weird. So we had a, a lady, um, I mean, she looked ancient. She looked like she was in her nineties. Um, she was curled up. She was shuffling. She was frail. She was shaky. And I would do the metaphor work and Catherine would then do the exercises and the body adjustment. And we all said, you know, and she was, she was like an, an old, um, I can't remember a metaphor for what it was like when she was old, but anyway, she was, it was papery, it was shaky. And she said, you know, she said, it's like, I just can't find my spirit. I said, you just can't find my spirit. And when it's my spirit, what kind of spirit is that spirit? And she said, it's, she said, it's, it's like, it's rising. Well, that's an interesting thing. You know, it's, it's a funny word. I'm like, it's rising. Is there anything else about that, the rising of that spirit? And she said, well, you know, like sap. Said, oh, okay. She said, and when it's sap that's rising and she was all curled over and she couldn't see properly, she couldn't hear properly. And she said, it's, it's, and when it's rising, whereabouts is it rising? And she said, oh, it's, I probably have to see. She said, it's, it's, it's a back. 
So I guess just below, and a woman just below where your bra strap is, but from the inside, she said it, it's like it's inside. And so when it's rising, it's, where's it rising from? She said, well, she said everything. She's just, just my soul. And I said, when it's rising, whereabouts is the first place it's rising? And she said, well, it just, and it was a very slow session. And it just, as she described it, she just very, very gently started to straighten up. And then it was, you know, as in it, then it rises like what? Oh, it's it's strange. It's sort of it's got branches. If it's got branches, where are those branches? She's like, <sighs> well, they sort of they leave, they they come out. And anything else about those branches? Yes, they they rustle in the wind. And when they, and when they rustle in the wind, anything else about that rustling? She said, oh, I like the sound. There's probably birds in them. But it was extraordinary. It was because as she came up, as the metaphor developed sound. And what Catherine said afterwards, she said that as she's lifting her head, as her head comes up and these muscles are relaxing, then she can hear better. She could see better. Mm -hmm. So we did three sessions with her and she, by the third session, she was walking like a proper person. She was, and it must have taken 20 years off her. And was so, her body doing what, because I don't know if you were mirroring it or like where you started low and then as it expanded her body yeah. her body as in order to stay with and we weren't just working with her so I, sorry i probably need to tell you the, a bit of the process because there's six people i'll work a little bit with her mm. and so she just got to the sap and the sap was just rising and it came from her soul and then i leave her to to pay attention to that but catherine at the same time she might be doing little rockings or little manipulations just to loosen. Mm. So, and what I had taught her, I said, don't have an outcome apart from what's just adjacent to what she can already has just done. So she mm. wanted to be doing little rocking. I go on to the next person, Catherine does a little bit, then she watches me, go on to the next, go on to the next. So they are also like the teenagers, they are listening to one another's systems develop at the same time. So you were doing systemic modeling at that time, where all of them were. No, no, because systemic modeling is more where I'm getting the group to learn the skills from me. This was more like doing group therapy. It was like I was doing one, then another, but they were listening. They could hear each other. I oh, wasn't okay. getting them to ask each other questions or develop self-modeling, but they okay. were hearing each other. But yeah, but by the third session, you know, she was coming in. She was using her feet. So instead of when she first came in, it was like her feet were rigid and it was just... But it was shuffling as well, like, but but when she was here the by the third session, she was walking like a real person. And wow. the, so that, that was up in Newcastle General Hospital, the first one we did. And then the next one, I think I've, I've told you about it before. The other one that I saw that was like, oh my goodness, was the Bell's palsy. So that mm -hmm. was somebody where his face was was all really dropped and lifeless like only one side of his face was animated and the other was lifeless and we said you know it's a bit, a bit like what he said it's he said you know it's it's funny it's like it's like this has just been turned off he said what kind of a turn is that turn when it's turned off he said well you know like a like a signal that's no longer needed on the railway hmm. oh when it's on no, a signal no longer re Needed on the railway. What kind of railway is that railway? He still thought it's funny. He said that reminds me of, uh, oh God, a railway I built with my dad. You know, he used to used to have model railways in the attic. Oh my God, he was a nightmare. And then said, oh. so you just let these little things sneak through. And he said, and anything else about that signal? He's like, oh, it's like danger, danger. Yeah. And he said, you know, it's that would be my dad. Just, you know, I've, you have to listen for the tone. Something's gone wrong. He's all going to kick off. And it's that signal just used to flicker. He said, and then oh, it just got too much. It just went out. I said, and then it just went out. And he said, anything else about that, that, that railway and that? And he said, just, you know, it's like it's all in the dark now. <sighs> he said, no, he's dead now. He said, there's, there's not even any need for that signal. Hmm. I said, it's in the dark now. And it used to flicker danger, danger, and then it just went out. It was all too much. And like that railway, is there anything else about that railway? He said, you know, he said, you know, I loved that railway. He said, it moved, it, it, 
And I said, what kind of signal was that signal when the railway moved? He said, we know that was like more red and white. And he said, no, what kind of signal? He said, well, that was like, go, stop, go, stop. And as he just, as the metaphor just shifted, hmm. it was like the skin just came alive. I had never, I remember feeling absolutely out of my depth. Um, it didn't fully heal that that session in front of me, but by again by the we would see them once a week for three weeks, and by the third session you could hardly tell that he'd ever with a little tiny flicker in this corner of his mouth and a little tiny flicker, um, and but Catherine said it takes a while for the muscles to retone yeah. up again because it had mm -hmm. been so long that he'd had it, and I remember, and I said to her, but how could that? I was like, how could it be that the face just transforms? And she didn't really know either. And I think there was one of the, the there was some issues for me around this. And one is what, that we didn't know why it was happening. We didn't know why this helped. Yeah. All we knew, she had, a, she had a few theories. She said, you know, when the body doesn't know, sometimes it does just give up and it just switches things off. It goes, it's too frightening or it's too much effort. And that when they get reactivated, she said they can just, you know, start working again. And I'm like, anyway, it, it seemed like magic to me. Yeah. Um, and I've really, I've mainly stuck. I, I will work one-to-one -one with clients, um, but I prefer to have a, a qualified, experienced body worker with me, mm -hmm. just in case, do you know, just in case I'm missing something or, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm curious, what kind of things would you be missing that you would like to have someone there for? Do you know, that's so funny. I, it's, it's bound just to be something in my system, Brian. It's like, yeah. I do quite like to, to be sure that I can do things right. Mm. Um, I'm quite clumsy. So I think as a child, I grew up knocking things over and I don't want to break anybody. Um, you know, like we've we've done chronic chronic migraine. Um, we're a client, a business client with chronic migraine, and every week since she was twenty years old and she was in her fifties, and then uh, Sean put her in the whirly gig. This is another clean tool. It's like a clean gyroscope. Hmm. So you imagine, do you know, a gyroscope that goes in any direction. So she was in the gyroscope, and actually, do you know, funny that you said that because it's not dissimilar to you. She said, "I feel like I'm falling over." And so I thought, oh, I wonder whether we could put her in the gyroscope because so Sean would put her in and he'd go, OK, we could go this way, this way, this way, this way. Like what direction? And she would just show us with a hand and she's like, yep, yeah, that's the edge of my migraine. Hmm. And if we tried, if we went into it, it was like this. And if we came out of it, it was hilarious. And he played just on the edge of this migraine. And then he she she asked him, she said, I feel like I want to go up. And she, he turned the giants go up, 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 and round and up. And we did six very slow upside down loops and it went. Mm. And she went back to work and she never had another migraine. That was it. And she went, oh, what was that? And her colleagues at work said, what was that? And if you do if ever read my book, the, the whole thing in um, the fast moving consumer goods company came about, mm. about because of that piece of work. Wow. So I don't know what I'm terrified of. Okay. It's it's a little bit about, I don't know that you should mess too much with things that you don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that as long as I'm clean, um, I don't ever promise things that I don't think I can. So when people say, oh, do you think you can fix this? I go, nah. I'll tell you what I can do, though. I can ask some really good attention so I can pay ex really good questions I can pay exquisite attention and we yeah. can find out what your system knows that you might not know about it and see if there yeah. are any clues to how you can how you can um su support yourself get into self-care yeah. so I'm very humble in what I'll promise but mm -hmm. I have seen extraordinary changes yeah and that's for me where I kind of it's like I, I can't promise you'll completely be pain-free 
but I know wherever you're starting, you'll feel better than where you started most because we do the movement side. Yeah. And then from a symbolic modeling or coaching standpoint, just the awareness of how you're dealing with symptoms can make a huge difference. For me, yeah. I had a session where like, I realized I was going as slow as needed with the body work so that I could then go as fast as possible where I wanted to run, lift, do everything. And I couldn't get beyond a half mile comfortably walking until I let go the need of doing it fast, slow to fast. And then I was like, I'm trying to lift weights and I can't even walk a half a mile. Like I should walk first before I do anything else. And when I did that, I got to like five, eight miles and went on hikes with family. I'm like, even though the might not have treated the symptom itself, how I was approaching it shifted. And then I had the space to be like, okay, I can slow down because I should, if I do the basics, then just slowly expanding. And so that's kind of the, where I'm at with people is like, okay, there's a couple things. There's the emotions of stress, which don't typically promote healing. There's the structure of the body. And then there's the mindset of how we approach the experience. And, and whether the, from what you're just saying there, because it ties in with something I was doing um, before we got into this call, what you talked about there is that where the way that you're approaching it is is systematically interrupting the thing that you're trying to do. So by wanting to do it fast, you're preventing mm -hmm. yourself from going at any speed. Do you know it's that? Yeah. Because that's that's similar. You know, if if you're in a big system, something I was talking about this morning, where she says, oh, "I want people to self be self organizing." Oh, they haven't spoken. Oh, let me speak for them. Oh, I don't know if they're getting this fast enough. Let me just talk for them. Mm -hmm. But like the way that you're trying to get them self organized will never get yourself organized it's yeah yeah the, the method is is um incongruent with the outcome yeah and yeah. yeah it was it's just so amazing how much learning from our own system that the awareness has gained and how we don't necessarily need to transform the symptom itself but if we transform ourselves we can face the symptom yes and and yeah. you can if you look at the context within which the symptom is happening and get let that feedback to yourself yeah, yeah there'll be loads of learning in that so i'm i'm curious with have you had in my mind it's hard for me to imagine doing a modeling session and not learning from the pain in some way or like if you model a physical symptom that you wouldn't learn something have you had sessions where it's like okay we just have a metaphor for pain nothing changed does it do you typically the awareness itself go on oh no yeah no typically typically it it the awareness itself it's almost like the being paid attention eases the body is that mm -hmm. is this what you mean so it's like you learn so by so i had um this was this was a one-to-one -one client not a group and i was on my own with her so she had polyneuromyalgia and mm -hmm. um it her metaphor for the pain was that it's that somebody's put concrete dust in my blood and the whole of my body has concrete dust which either slows it down in some areas or it's set completely in others and mm -hmm. i think she had 70 percent non-movement in her body at the time this is a measurement that you can have yeah. and so we just the first session we just modeled the pain nothing else this concrete what kind of concrete was it and when it's in dust and where does the dust because concrete's an interesting one it's not yeah. just that it sets it's that it's man-made mm. you know there's lots of things about the entailments of metaphors when you get really good at this stuff you're like hang on a minute you know it's not just this it's it's something that's created and so when the next session we came round, i said you know what's happened since the last session she said you know it's funny i just keep my mind keeps going back and I was going, I went to talk to my mum about it. My mind kept going back after our session to about the way I was conceived. She said, I was illegitimate. My parents had to get married because they were pregnant with me. And my mum said, oh yeah, she said, do you know, I was conceived in a doorway. And she said, and that concrete square hmm. changed the direction of my whole life. And she said, and I thought, isn't that interesting words that she's used, this concrete square where yeah. her mother had, had, had become pregnant with her. And what this dust was, was it was the um, the Irish community in that 
town where this concrete square was and the judgment that they had about an unmarried, unwed mother, yeah. um, you know, a young girl getting pregnant and that this had gone into her system. So I thought that was a lovely example where we just got the metaphor, but the metaphor had such significance. And, and with her, we did have, she was another one of the, the big results um, sessions where we, you know, we then we went in on the second and the third sessions, we went into, you know, what does the con what would the concrete like to have happen? What it wants to go back into being a liquid, what kind of liquid it would be like, it was a, a light, a, a very light, almost pinkish fairy light. And it went through the baby, it went through conception and it went through into, it went through generations. It was what we call intergenerational healing in this stuff. Yeah. And she, again, that was one of those ones where it was ridiculous that she, her body started to be able to move again. We were like, whoa. Um, oh, but it, yeah. Yeah. Over time, so you said 70% immovable or. Yeah, so she went down, so she didn't, um, recover absolute full health we, we only had four sessions we had four sessions once about once a month for four months yeah. um but she got to 40 percent so that therefore then she had 60 percent movement hmm. yeah and she still she does other work as well with herself she's still alive um that yeah. was a long that was 25 years ago yeah yeah, and I'd be curious the sustained, like continued modeling, what happens over 10 years of self work type thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because if four sessions brought back or decreased 70% to 40%, that's a huge. I, I, I don't know what you find with your clients, but it's, I, I think it's similar with, with therapy clients. Um, so I did a lot of work over 10 years. But for some clients, they'll do three sessions and go, that's as, that's as well as I want to be right now. Hmm. And then they might have a couple of years away and then they come back and go, okay, I'm ready to be weller. And yeah. it's a very interesting thing, how much people do or don't want to change. Yeah, I had someone the other day I talked to about doing some more work because she's like, I'm feeling pretty good, but I, there's more. And I'm like, well, would you like to do another session? She's like, I think I'm as good as I can be right now. It's yeah. like, okay. And for me, I'm like, well, if this can get this good, what would like continued practice do? There'll be, you'll have a pattern of one of these because that's a little bit like your, I want to be able to run fast. I want to be able to lift weights. It's like, if you can go this much, surely we'd like to go further. Yeah. And I think for some people, it's just not the case. Yeah. They want to get to, to somewhere where they're tolerable. And for if you're, you've had enough chronic pain, it's like, Sometimes just the basics, like getting through your day, feeling decent is such a contrast. Like that's enough. Like mm -hmm. sometimes it's like, well, don't you want to try jumping or running? And they're like, no, if I can walk up and down the stairs feeling good, that's great. Like I had an amazing day and I'm like, excellent. Like, let's get you there. Yeah. But, and also for some of them, they don't want to jinx it. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the same with clients. It's like they can go so far and then they're like, okay, I'm just going to hold on to this. Yeah. Um, and I, I try to be very respectful about that and go, I don't know whether maybe that is best for their system. Mm -hmm. Maybe running and jumping would overstimulate it in some way. Maybe we don't know. Yeah. So, but yeah, I do know what you mean. I, I sometimes think, oh my goodness, if it was that successful so much, wouldn't you just keep going? But not everybody does. No. And yeah, honoring where they're at and their place is like, okay, that's perfect. Yeah. So... Um, we're about out of time. Uh, is there are, anything? Yeah. yeah, it went quick. Um, is there anything you'd like to share about symbolic modeling, systemic modeling, and especially around physical symptoms? The first thing is anyone can start asking where, what kind of, is there anything else? Mm -hmm. Those are really three simple questions that you can add into your stuff. Only ask one or two questions and then go back to your normal work. If you mm -hmm. wanted to take it deeply, get some proper training. You know, we've got, we're at cleanlearning.co.uk. Um, there's, there's trainers in the States, so you can learn online. But but don't let that stop you practicing right now. You can say it's a bit like what, and then whatever they say, what kind of, where, is there anything else? Hmm. You can go a long way with those questions. Yes. And if I highly recommend the Clean for Teams program that you, you lead and just, yeah, Clean language in general is just such a useful tool for understanding other people 
and getting broader insights. And so highly recommend any of the training uh, with you or anyone else in the community. Um, it's really powerful work. Think of it as just it's just about being able to pay much higher quality attention because you're not so busy making assumptions. You can actually see and hear what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I know you just said the clean was it clean learning or and was it clean learning you said dot co dot uk is that the one yeah. to go to? clean learning dot co dot uk yeah is there any other places you'd like them to go to learn more or whether it's your book or otherwise oh uh, yeah well, there's my book um from contempt to curiosity there's also a really nice manual if you wanted to kind of go through this and learn some of it it's called so you want to be drama free mm. that's quite a nice manual too and if you're a coach i would probably go for Marion Way's Clean Approaches for Coaches. Excellent. And I'll put that all in the uh, show notes. Um, and so that way people can go to those. And uh, I, I recommend all of it. I'm going through Marion's training now with the ICF uh, yeah. training. And oh, that's lovely. Because that's a, it's a really nice, you'll learn it in depth for each chunk. Yeah. That's great. I'm a bit more like, well, hey, do some stuff. But Marion's like, learn this, learn this. And then you'll know how good you are. Yeah, so I like that aspect of her training because it feels more thorough, but I also will read a book and like, let's start trying it with people. It's like, hey, how does this work? And so yeah. it's, a, it's a lot of fun. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, potentially may invite you back again because I really enjoyed it. And I think you have a lot to offer, especially. We have, a, we have a whole day on clean body work on the 19th of May in the UK next year. So I'm going to be doing some research between now and then, and I'll come back to you with what I've found. And then maybe we'll do some footage on that day and we can we can liaise about it. Oh, that'd be fantastic. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, that is it for today.